Vienna Ensemble Pro. What would my life be without Vienna Ensemble Pro? Um, I started beta testing it back when I was working on the first Dead Space series. It was probably 2007. At the time, computers, their operating system was 32-bit. And you had, if memory serves, when I was a young boy, computers only had four gigabytes of internal memory per application. So I think it was four gigabytes of RAM within each app. So if I'm a digital performer, which is what I was working on at the time, I could only use four gigabytes of sounds. That's including the memory footprint that the app takes up. So VE Pro allowed you to break that open. And that was the first time I bought a PC as well, because I was using a PC as a slave. I'm talking all about Vienna Ensemble Pro today, and I'm probably going to show more than I'm going to talk about and scroll through some things and not talk about every single little point because there's a lot of instruments to go over. But by all means, if you see something and you want to take a look at it, just hit pause and you can see the whole entire screen. So, where should we start? Um, let's start here. This is like my master setup for VE Pro. So everything that's going in and coming out, I'm keeping track of in this doc. And it is rather long, but I think it's important if you start doing specific outputs the way I have them, where I've got long horns and short horns and horns effects, and that's for the Spitfire library, then I need that for the Berlin Brass library, and I need that for my own library. I get a little confused because I keep changing things every now and then. I tweak the template probably two or three times a year when there's a little bit of downtime between one big project has ended and another big project might be starting. I like to make things work a little better, make things, you know, adjust them to where I feel more comfortable with them. And I found over time that uh, as I was adjusting things, I would forget what the previous input was or what the previous MIDI channel was, or I want to add a new instrument, let's say. I got all these great adventure strings and trailer strings and stuff um, from, uh, from my friend and I didn't know what MIDI channel to put them in on because I hadn't kept track of things. So that's what this document is all about. Um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a walkthrough through a couple of these columns. I think it's pretty straightforward what everything really means. But at the top, so we've got um, window 1, window 2, string 01, string 02. These are my VE Pro instances. Now the only reason I have more than one instance of wins, for example, is there's a MIDI channel limit of, I think it's 40 or 45 individual um, like master MIDI channel inputs that VE Pro can carry. And there's also an audio channel limit of, I believe, 400 or 500 audio outs. So if I have more than one instance, it's because I either ran out of MIDI channels, which I think is the case here when I see that this is MIDI channel 42, probably ran out of MIDI channels here. Or maybe I ran out of audio channels, which is probably the case over here in the drums because I can see I'm already on channel 235, 236. So the idea is, if we look at this column, Berlin Woodwinds high, long, and short, Berlin Woodwinds low, long, and short. So those are the outputs, the actual physical outputs of the Window 1 VE Pro instance. I know Berlin Woodwinds high, long is going out of 1 and 2. And I know the MIDI channels that are coming into that are 16 through 25, and 42. Now each one of these MIDI channel instances is actually 16 individual MIDI channels. This is the genius of VE Pro and I'll talk about all this a little more when we're looking at VE Pro but I just thought it might help a little bit to get an overview because this is the first thing that I go to when I'm trying to figure out wait a minute I can't hear my fill-in-the-blank sound and I see MIDI's going to it and the contact instrument is playing in VE Pro is my output did it get misassigned somehow? If I'm doing chamber strings, like here, violin shorts, I know that should be coming out of 3 and 4 on strings 02. I can double check the MIDI channel and everything else. So if I scroll down a little bit, we go from winds, and then strings, and then synth, and then drums. I'm a old school, classical kind of guy, so 
it's just one of those things that I think about the orchestra the way I would see it like on a score, like from, from top to bottom. And the, the winds are at the top with the woodwinds and then the brass. The French horns are above the trumpets because that's the way Mozart did it. And by golly, that's good enough for me. Then you've got percussion and then you've got strings. And then I have like ancillary drums and synth and stuff are at the end. So it's sort of a, a top down approach. And that's how we're going to um, address all the VE Pro instances as well. So if we just look at winds, for example, over here, you can see I've got different libraries with different outputs. You know, there's not a whole lot to say about this. Um, I color code it because it makes it easier for me to keep track of things. If you see a big empty instance like this, that's because it was something that I ended up taking out and there's some outputs available, but I didn't necessarily want to squeeze that space back. Like right here, I know I've got empty outputs here. I think that's from something that I, um... oh, these are contact instances. So if we scroll up, I've got contact A and contact B. Those are just empty open instances of contact waiting to be filled. And each instrument, contact A01, A02, that's a single instance of contact. And then one through 16, all of these reds is just one instance of contact with 16 individual outs within that instance. And that's the way we were talking about routing outputs from contact in the previous video. So this way I can have two instances of contact on my one VE Pro server and I'm actually getting 32 instruments with dedicated outs from every single one of them. And that's a lot better than having 32 instances of individual contact things. Now a lot of this actually depends on how many tracks you have because I'd say if you're doing you know, it's an arbitrary number because it depends on how fast your computer is and how much memory you have. But there is some sort of a threshold, and I've confirmed this with Native Instruments uh, a while ago, um, a couple of years. But there's a threshold where, you know, it's a bit of an arbitrary number, but I mean, if, you, if you've got, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 different instruments going on, having them in individual contact instances is probably okay. It makes it a lot easier. You don't have to route all those outputs. You just have your contact instance. And if you're in Cubase, it's bundling that with a MIDI channel. So you just click on it. You can record enable, you name it. It's got its own output and you're good to go. When you start talking about things like this, where there's so many instances of contact, it makes a lot more sense for me to use these multiple outs. So instead of I mean, I don't even know how it would count how many contact instances there are, but it's probably 200 or 250 maybe off the top of my head. Multiply that times 16. It makes a lot more sense to have these individual instances. One contact instance right here, Hans Zimmer High, with 16 individual outputs. And most of these are grouped by 16 channels. Now, in this case, Hans Zimmer Low, I only had 12. And this was when I was first building my template and I went straight from 79 and 80 to my high Hans Zimmer drums, 80 and 81. I don't do that anymore. And the main reason for that is the inputs are not named in Cubase and you have to name them individually. And I want to be able to see what those are called. Obviously, this is a lot of VST returns and labeling them takes a while. So if I want to add another four channels. That was up to channel 12. If I want to go all the way up to 16 and add those bottom ones, I need to make it a different set of inputs at the very bottom of the list, starting at input 337 or something like that. Now, technically that doesn't really matter, but it would have been a lot easier if I had kept those four extra contact instances, if I kept those outputs open and just said HZ low, maybe XX, so that I knew there was nothing there, but the outputs were already assigned and Importantly, the MIDI channels were already assigned. If we did that, there'd be some space right here. And I would know automatically I've got four extra inputs there. Now again, I'll try not to keep saying this, but I understand this is on a, a larger level than maybe a few of you are used to seeing. But really, you'd be surprised, especially if you're working on any kind of a template, how quickly something like this can balloon. And pretty soon it's six months later and you're at a loss to remember how you wired one thing or the other. And you've made some changes and they weren't documented. Documentation is key. It really does make a huge difference. Um, going down, 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 just... Um, 
lots of separate instances of things. And you can see from the names, I've got kind of a hierarchy naming order, how I keep track of, of what's what. And of course, Heaviosity is pretty much everywhere. So down here, this is actually, these are all a single instance. That's why it's not called Drumzo 1 and Drumzo 2. I just ran out of columns and I didn't want to have to scroll. Well, this would be 800 cells rows down. I split it into two so I could keep track of it. But there we're at output 444, which I think 450 is our limit. But we'll go back and take a look in VE Pro itself. Now that you've seen that, we'll figure out a way to get VE Pro open. All right, why don't we start top down and do wins first? Does that sound like a good idea? I think it sounds like a good idea. Okay, so if you remember looking at that doc, I have two separate WEND instances within VE Pro. Now, there's a couple of icons here that are worth pointing out, and maybe if I hover over them, they'll give me some sort of a... Oh, I see down at the bottom. Okay, so down here, it gives you a little shortcut. I am not a technical engineer kind of person who will be able to tell you exactly what a button means. I'm more of a, hey, that icon does this when I click on it. So this little plug, it says instance not connected. So that basically indicates whether the computer, my main computer, is connecting to the slave. Right now, I don't have anything open in Cubase. I just wanted to leave it all separate. That turns on and off by itself. When you uh, open Cubase, if you have an instance of VE Pro sitting there that was connected before you closed that particular session, it's going to reconnect automatically. <clears throat> this icon keeps the instance loaded when disconnected, is what the info says. That's what's really important. If that was not clicked, if it was grayed out, when you close your session, Cubase dumps out uh, Cubase. VE Pro is going to dump everything when Cubase closes. Now, I actually use that feature on my synths because those are project specific. But my orchestra and drum sounds, I keep as a template, and they're always the same. And this saves me a lot of time. Right now, I've got 128 gigs of RAM on this computer, and uh, 90 gigabytes are full. And that is actually with everything purged. Um, it purges, but it's still, there's a lot of residual memory going on there. And we can talk about that in a minute. So that's what I want to keep lit. And then all this really does is it will do different things for everything if it's coupled or decoupled. I'm trying to see if I get a... Keeps the instance loaded when disconnected. So there's a lot of VE Pro terminology that I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to educate you on. All I know is this lock is the super important thing. So I've got Winzo 1, Winzo 2, and drums. Now these are all on version 2. Again, I mentioned keeping backups of things and versioning and keeping track of what you change. 2018 version 2. So whenever I do any bit of a tweak, I save it as a version number. So we're about halfway through the year. I'm only on version 2 right now, and it's really not that bad. But so many times I've accidentally saved it under a different name, or I've saved this one over on top of that one accidentally because I clicked on the wrong file name in the save dialog. Having backups of everything in a separate folder has saved my life multiple times. So, I've got in Woodwinds, uh, Berlin Woodwinds, Spitfire Woodwinds, Spitfire Brass, um, IO Horns. Uh, the IO Brass is my own personal sample library that I've made over the years, sample modeling brass, and then pianos. Now, you know, I'm not going to go through every one of these things because really I'm a bit of a sample hog. And what I end up doing is just putting everything um, into contact and letting it sit there. So if I have Berlin Woodwinds, it pretty much means that every articulation from Berlin Woodwinds has been loaded into contact and is sitting there ready to go. But one thing we can do 
is look at these individual outputs right down here. This is one of the things I was talking about in the previous video, number two. Having individual outputs in contact, long and short. You know, it's really the only two splits that I need for woodwinds. I don't have any effects um, in Berlin woodwinds. I'm just using either a long or a short. So if you look at Piccolo Legato, the output is set to long. And you've got a choice, either long or short. Obviously, we go to Piccolo Staccato, it's set to short. So the idea is that a short goes out the short, a long goes out the long, and then when you come over here to the mixing window, I've got a bus set up. And it's going out of Ber Berlin Woodwinds high long. Now, why am I bussing it as opposed to just going straight into the computer? Well, the piccolo is not the only high woodwind that I want to send to the computer. So instead of having a bunch, I mean a whole bunch of different kinds of sends, I've got buses down here at the end. And in the general scheme of things, if you look to the left, if it's gray, that means that it's some sort of a sub output from contact. If it's this orange color, that means it's a bus. And if it's another color, purple or blue or whatever that color is, that means it's an actual contact instance. So I colored those really quickly so I can scroll and I can see that every one of these contact instances has one additional out. And we know that it's long and short. So the idea is the piccolo has either a long or short sound. This first instance is long. The second instance is short. And they're bussing to their appropriate long and short. And that's a collective of all the high woodwinds from Berlin or Orchestra. All the high Berlin woodwinds. And since it's the first instance that we're looking at, it's going out of one and two. And then the shorts are going out of three and four. If we went to flute three, legato is long, staccato is short, long and short, it's the same sort of thing. You go here, flute three, we've got long and short. They're also going over here out of Berlin, long and short. Woodwinds high long, and this is woodwinds high short. So it's kind of a matter of thinking super granular at the beginning, and then how do you get it the most simple? High long, high short. Low long, low short. And the outputs, oh, there we go, 600. You've got up to 600 outputs. The buses, you can add as many as you want. But just for clarity's sake, you can see I've got Berlin Woodwinds high and short. Berlin Woodwinds, oh, I'm clicking on one of them. High and short, low long, low short. Spitfire Woodwinds high and short. Spitfire Woodwinds low long and low short. Same thing with the brass. Horns, long and short. Trumpets, long and short. Trombones, long and short. Low brass, which is basically bass trombones, tubas, chimbasos, long and short. Then we get to my library, long and short, and effects. Oh, look, there's a typo. I'm sure we're going to have fun coming across all kinds of typos and, and things that I've done wrong and just haven't caught yet. That should be effects. So the reason I have an effects stem on here is my library is a bunch of standard articulations but I also have, it's very heavy on the effects. And the reason you see three sets of horns, long, short, and effects, is that's how I sampled them. I sampled them in pairs. So it's six horns, but I sampled them in pairs one and two, then three and four, and then five and six. So it's a, a pair of horns, but they're three separate pairs of horns, which really makes a big difference in the sound. Uh, and then trombones, long and short, and tubas, long and short. So those are the groups that are in this particular instance of VE Pro. Sometimes there are some EQs or compressors. Ah, here we go. So in my horns, um, it's another great thing about VE Pro. You can host VST effects. So this is a multi-band, so I'm basically expanding the top end of the horns and doing some compression. I bet that's around, yep, 380, which is a little honky for the horns. Same thing on all three sets of horns. And you can see here's my horns long out of 33 and 34, horns one short, 35 and 36, and so on. It just kind of keeps moving down. Now just to satisfy the completists, We'll take a look real quick at some of these things and I'll get rid of the outputs and see if I can pull this down anymore. So piccolo, oh, it's only gonna do it for each instance of contact. 
Okay. Piccolo, flute one, flute two, flute three. It's great. Berlin's got uh, kind of consistent articulations across everything. See, look, there's a little, oh, we've got 18 megabytes of RAM sitting there. Now, if you ever want to purge anything, you just do this, purge all samples. It's going to get rid of everything. Now, I have my contacts settings aggressively worked out to where the computers are streaming off of SSD drives. So I have very low um, what samples loaded in terms of the contact memory, and I've got high samples streaming off the disk. In addition to that, I have it set up so that you have everything purged, as you can see right here. And if I had Cubase open and started playing, I honestly wouldn't even be able to tell that it was purged because it starts loading immediately and it's basically playing the little bit of sample that is still in memory. And I know there's something there because there's 90 gigabytes of something loaded and it will slowly pull in the additional samples that I'm playing and kind of run those into contact. And then the memory footprint will go up a little bit as far as RAM is concerned. Now I do have... A f well, two years ago, it was a pretty fast machine. Um, it was the fastest that I could get. So it was a 12 core. These are the slaves, the three slaves. Um, 12 core, whatever the fastest thing was back then. I'm terrible about processing power and all that. But a super fast, like double 12 core machine or something like that with 128 gigabytes of RAM. And it's basically just sitting. Like the processor sits at zero when it's used. And the RAM just sits there at like 85 or 90 gigs. And even when I'm using it, it, the processor might do 25 or 30 percent. It's basically, it's too much of a computer for what I'm using it for. But I love that. I'd rather have it be too much than not enough. So as a result, I'm able to take all of these libraries and just have them sitting there. Clarinets. So this is one of the examples where, yeah, if I were watching someone, I might be interested in seeing how they have things lined up and I'm not going to go through and read all of these but at least this way feel free to pause the screen and take a look that's everything that Berlin Woodwinds has um, Spitfire Woodwinds is the same way I think um, they might have a couple of extra things that I don't have on here this is sort of like the core library their bass and alto flutes are gorgeous and their low woodwinds are pretty amazing as well one of the things that I really love that I think is worth mentioning is having these three separate flutes or two different oboes or two clarinets or two bassoons from Berlin. That makes a huge difference in the timbre to me. That's how I sample things. Like I mentioned sampling the French horns in pairs. The musicians and the instruments are completely different from each other. And having that sort of tonal choice, I think is super, super cool. As a matter of fact, I was in the middle of editing well, probably more like the beginning of of editing my own woodwind library that I had already sampled. And it's just a lot of work. I did strings and then I went and did brass. And I'm doing it all the, all this by myself. I think I had I had an assistant. Um, Dan Schneider was assisting me for part of that. But it's just a, it's a lot of work to edit your own sample library. And like lots of articulations and round robins and, and lots of control. And I still use it. And I love it, but by the time I got to Woodwinds, it, was, it had been like three years of working on this kind of full-time around all my other projects. And I got a little burnt out on Woodwinds. And that's when um, Berlin came out with their Woodwind series. And it was literally like, this is exactly the way I sampled my Woodwinds. I had three flutes and two piccolos and two oboes and two clarinets, and I recorded them all individually. That's what they did. So it's sort of been... Well, I haven't gone back to finish my woodwinds yet. I need to because there's some great effects and things in there. But for core articulations, it's, it's really, really nice having the Berlin woodwinds. It's probably my default woodwind library that I go to um, at first. And then I'll come in, especially with these low reeds, and beef up the sound with the Spitfire woodwinds. Spitfire brass. Oh, um, well, I have, so I have, there's a feature you can enable and disable channels right here. Now, I only have horns 1 and 2 and horns A2 disabled because usually when I'm using Spitfire, I'm using the 6 group ensemble. And if I want to use smaller horns, I'll go back to Berlin. 
because they do have just beautiful horns, one through four, all sampled individually, so you can have all four of them separately. I loaded these up before I got Berlin Brass, so I still have them here, and I can just literally hit a key and they'll load, but I figured, you know, why bother with the space? It, I think a year had gone by, and I just hadn't used them yet. The six horns are absolutely gorgeous. And see, my trumpets are also grayed out. That's because I'm using the Berlin as a default. That does not mean that the Spitfire trumpets are not good. They're phenomenal. I just like the control of those individual. It's like three individual trumpets. Beautiful. Count me in. Trombones, very, very nice. All kinds of fun articulations there. That's trombone 1-2. So I think what I did here is it's actually, well, it says... Ah, two. Solo short, solo long. So this is solo trombone, but what I did was I duplicated the solo trombone. So if I wanted to play two solo trombone parts, quote unquote, not that it's actually a, a solo part, but if I wanted a traditional orchestra where I've got two trombones, a bass trombone, and a tuba, this way I duplicated the solo trombone. So I've got solo trombone kind of times two. If I wanted to do like a legato line or something like that, even though it's the same player, they wouldn't be playing in unison. That's the point of having that doubled up. So that's trombones one and two, and then this is trombones atu, which always makes me think achu, but it's both bones playing at the same time. And then bass trombones and tubas. And contrabass trombones and chimbasos. So there's no super secrets or anything with all this stuff. It's just really, um, I put it all into contact. <laughs> uh, this is my core library for brass that I did myself. Um, I mean, if you've heard the score to Tomb Raider, you've heard my custom samples. That's the first soundtrack that I used pretty much exclusively my own samples. But I've got uh, crescendos and portados, which is just like the opposite of a crescendo. Um, staccatos, swells, sustains, rips, and it's just a, um, a key switch to go between them um, on the core. And then I've got these uh, great effects that are sampled in really cool ways. And you know, I'll probably go through this at some point in time just if, uh, if folks are interested. So it's horns one, horns two, and horns three. It's pretty much all the same thing. And then I've got low brass, um, trombones, same core kinds of samples, bass trombones, and tubas. Uh, sample modeling, I absolutely love. Um, I was emailing with uh, Peter Sidlicek talking about, hey, have my trombone. Oh, I guess this is more trombones for me. Okay. Maybe they're doubled up and I don't realize it. Well, who knows? I was emailing with Peter Sidlicek, um when I think it was the trombone first came out from sample modeling and I was getting ready to go starting to sample my own thing and I did a couple of demos for him and we were talking a lot about the super geeky stuff, but I've been a huge fan of his ever since his first sample library came out like in 97 or 98. And then we've got pianos. This is the Spitfire Hans Zimmer piano, which is just gorgeous. I really like that one. This, I believe, is the Arnulfel... Al I can never pronounce his name. I'm sorry, dude. Oliver Arnold's uh, felt piano. Super great. Um, that's a really nice grandeur just for pop stuff. And then a nice little electric piano. So apparently... With Winds 01, I basically ran out of space, uh, MIDI channels, I'm assuming, and I had to move on to Winds 02. Berlin Brass. What do you know? And you've got Horn 1, Horn 2. So it looks like, you know, legato, long, portato, short, crescendo, swell, and trills. There's a lot more articulations than that. Um, I can always, oh, playable runs. I ended up putting that at the end. So I can always add additional articulations in my separate contact slots if I want to. I just wanted to have a nice breadth of core articulations available to me. And having all these open and all of them available, literally I can do something on the piano or do something maybe on a horn sound and then just scoot it up and down the tracks. So it makes it 
like really intuitive to um, figure out what library is better for a particular passage or if I want to double something, I don't have to worry about key switching or um, what articulation is particularly playing on this track. Everything's labeled, everything's straightforward. Makes great to just copy it and double it or to even move around and hear like different staccatos between different libraries. I think I've probably learned more having this ability to switch all the different sample companies than I did ever when I was, you know, in the heat of the moment, you're writing and you just want to make it sound good and then you end up spending 25 minutes either loading something or going through um, different key switches or different patch changes and it's just a lot easier for me to do it this way. So horns in one and two and three and four, pretty much the same thing. And then they also had a nice all four horns playing at the same time, so I've got that and the trumpets, so this is why I have the Spitfire trumpets not loaded right now. And then there's trumpet three plus the ensemble trumpets, which is also really nice. And a lot of times I'll cheat and I'll put, <laughs> I don't know if it's cheating or not, but I'll put the solo parts together. So that's them recorded as solo instruments and they blend together really nice. And then I'll put the ensemble part on top of that if they're all playing a unison line. and since they're separate recordings, there's no phasing problems or anything, and it sort of makes it sound like six trumpets instead of three. I'll do that with all the brass and woodwinds. Um, they just seem to stack really well. Strings aren't exactly the same way. I think it's something about the instrument and, and the overtones. Um, stacking strings, it doesn't necessarily sound bigger. It just kind of fills it in a different way. But with winds, I really do like stacking and it you can a lot of times cover up some of the things that might be a shortfall with that particular library if you add another library on top of it and balance the velocity and volume so this is uh my friend aaron's company i believe it's called musical sampling really amazing stuff he's here on the east coast with me as well i'm in north carolina by the way i don't think i mentioned that yet so i do not live in la I live in North Carolina, so I do appreciate all the emails asking to meet up for coffee and stuff, but I think um, for those of you that send the, hey, I just moved to LA, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Um, great, but it's going to be a really expensive cup of coffee for you because you got to get a plane ticket to North Carolina. Not that it wouldn't be fun. We would have fun for sure. So Adventure Brass, I've got all the articulations here. Uh, really, really great library. Um, there's the high brass and the low brass. Um, Hollywood Winds, <laughs> Hollywood Woodwood, Hollywood Winds is another great one from Cine Samples. I just haven't been doing lots of woodwind runs and things lately, but that's 16 patches of their basic runs and things. Really, really nice to have. Um, same thing with uh, Arc here, um, Berlin, geez, so it's not, it's Metropolitan, Metropolitis. Anyway, Arc 3. I'm sure you guys know what that is. Just not a lot of call for woodwinds right now, and I haven't used them in a while, so I've got them sort of out. Um, the brass is super nice in, in arc, so we've got lots of instances of those, plus the repetitions. Same thing with the trumpets. Repetitions and low brass and repetitions. And hopefully you've gotten the color scheme over here on the left now so you can see, because all I'm doing is clicking on the colored lanes here. If I clicked on that, it'd take me to the mixing board because that's just a contact output or a bus output. Cinebrass, I really love the Cine samples things too. So I've got um, the pro and the core or however it's called. I've got those broken up between horns, trumpets, and low brass. And hey, look, we're at the end of the winds. That's great. Why don't we move on to drums after I have a sip of water? So the same thing really applies here for drums. It's just a matter of having everything set up and ready to go so I can switch and stack. Of course, drums stack really, really well. Now, one thing um, actually worth mentioning is these are in no means uh, loops or hold down the key and textures. These are all single hit kind of drums things. I have all my loops on a separate computer that I don't even have hooked up to view because I just dump the loops in there and leave them alone. So VE Pro can access them, but I view them in the machine room. They're hooked up to a, a Mac 
and I wasn't planning on going through that because it's just lots and lots of loops. But if you guys are interested, I will totally make that happen and I can scroll through the the loops VE Pro setting as well. You know, a lot of this, I don't know. I don't know what sounds interesting and, you know, what's like, oh my gosh, he's going to go through every single one. So please just let me know and I'm totally happy to do it. So I, I was about to say I'll stop singing Heaviosity's praises, but I'm not. I'm going to keep talking about how much I love Heaviosity throughout this entire YouTube channel. So just uh, get used to it. I have all of their stingers from, I believe, the Evolve series. So everything's sitting here and ready to go and all labeled on the back end from Cubase. Another wonderful thing, um, their Aeon hits. The reason I've got 12 of these here, it's a, just a really great menu of just probably three and a half octaves of textures and everything's in the same key. So it starts in C and you play three and a half octaves and every single key is a different hit. And I also put a mod wheel assignment on CC1 so I can scoop it out and just have it be really muted or open up that filter and have it be a little louder. And I'll actually perform them that way a lot. So instead of worrying about a key switch, because there is a key switch at the very bottom of the keyboard where you can change the pitch and have it be an F or an A or whatever you want. Here, I actually just went in and duplicated it the original times 12, and you can see right here under the tuning, it's tuned up one, two, three, four, five, six, and then basically seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So I've got a chromatic instance of the Aeon hits, and in Cubase it's just labeled like Aeon hit C, Aeon hit C sharp, Aeon hit D. So I instantiate that MIDI channel, and I've got, I'm in whatever key I need to be without having to key switch. To me, that, that really helps a lot. Um, you'll notice also on the left that there's not a lot of colors. Um, the gray, it's like, like this down here. There's not a lot of individual outputs from contact because I basically just defaulted, as you can see right down here. I just needed everything on its own output. So I'm not saying like brass high short and brass high long. It's more like I want this on its own output. I want this on its own output. I want everything to have its own output. So that's where I use the little batch function, clear output and create one individual channel for each loaded instrument. It's also nice to point out, I mentioned this in the comments of my last video, you can save output configurations. And when I'm building these contact instruments, a lot of times it really helps me to have it saved so I don't have to sit there and do it every single time. Usually either long short or long short and effects are kind of the, the two of my go-tos. This is from Damage, I think, mm, maybe that's from Damage as well. It looks like it from the, oh, Gravity, sorry. Well, these are hits, Heaviosity hits. So we've got Damage and Gravity together, all the different hits. And sometimes I'll just have multiple instances because I love them and I want to be able to use more than one without adding something in those empty contact instances. So they'll be sitting there ready to go. Hans Zimmer percussion, I can't say enough great things about. It's nice to have such detailed sampled individual hits that aren't loops. I love loops, but being a drummer, I really prefer to roll my own and having individual hits like this makes a big difference. So this is every single drum from, I can't even remember how they're categorized, but it's like HCO1, HCO2, HCO3. Um, I don't have the drum set up in here. But those are basically the low drums. And then these are the high drums. And then here are the metals. So they're all ready to go as well. Oh, now we're a lot, nice long laundry list of heaviosity stuff. So all the damage percussion. And there's some things that probably aren't on here because they just have so many instruments, but I kind of picked and chose my favorites and, and included them. There's the first 16 of damage and then some more damage. This just says heaviosity drums. I think this might be more. Nope, let's go this way. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is the, what were they called? Master sessions, master session drums. So that's what low drums, snares, toms, trap case. That's the master session series. 
and then Master Sessions Ethnic Drums, and Master Sessions Metal, and Master Sessions Wood. Pretty much anything Heaviosity does, I own. Uh, not pretty much. I own everything that they have. <laughs> I am like the perfect res representation of the Heaviosity catalog. Um, Tonehammer, I've got some old stuff too that I really liked. Um, their single hits and stuff are really, really cool. Uh, the Tycho Ensemble sounds great. Um, the Epic Dole, Epic Frame Drums, Solo Frame Drums, and Toms. I still use those a little bit when I'm doing um, trailer stuff. They, they really cut through the mix. I've got the Spitfire um, Orchestral Percussion. Really wonderful sound. I love Spitfire. Spitfire and um, Orchestral Tools. Really, really classy European sample libraries. And then CineSample. Um, super classy American orchestral libraries. And there's a big difference, I, I think. I think there's a really big difference between having an American orchestra recorded in an American studio and a European, basically German or British orchestra, recorded in a German or British studio. Having recorded a bunch of different music in a bunch of different places all over the world, it's like, I mean, I don't want to generalize, but it's like um, American stuff is, is very precise and technically well done. Um, not that it doesn't have emotion. It does. European stuff feels more emotional, and I think it's just because of their heritage, because of the heritage of the musicians, the heritage of the recording engineers, the heritage of the studios and the microphones that they use. That's why I love to have both. And that doesn't mean that London isn't precise or LA isn't emotional. It's just there's a kind of prevailing vibe, and it's something that's, it, it is hard to explain but those are the sort of things I consider if I'm doing a live score and the developer says, well, where do you want to record? A lot of it's based on kind of what the score is, what the instrumentation is, and what the overall feeling's going to be. So here's um, CineSamples percussion, which I think I probably use a little more than the Spitfire percussion. Um, the Sony stage is a little more dry, and I know we've got mic control over everything, but... Um, I think it just pops a little more. I can, I can blend it a little better. I definitely like the timpani better in Cine Samples than I do in uh, Spitfire. Now, I couldn't tell you why. It's not better. I just prefer it. And then, oh, some really great... Um, oh, it's actually built into the... Down here, Flying Hand Percussion has some really nice um, mallets that I love. And I love the Spitfire harp. Um, I also have... The Orchestral Tools Harp, which I need to put in here from their, mm, I can't remember what it's called, like uh, one of the very first things they released. Um, I pretty much have everything that Orchestral Tools does as well. I don't have the first two arcs, but everything else is like really, really great. Um, here's the drums from Arc 3, and the only reason I've got bussing is because um, like a lot of the Tycos, I would bus together, and I think... We take a look at these. Tycos, Tycos, Tycos. Tonal drums. Cymbal ensembles. So yeah, I think it's like kind of large drum, small drum, metals, things like that. It's organized that way. And I'm pretty sure since this was one of the last things that I did, meaning like six months ago or something, if we go to the mixer... Yeah, I just have them going out of specific outputs. I haven't even labeled it here because I was getting lazy. And that's a problem when you have this many things that you're dealing with. But they're coming back into buses in Cubase, and those buses are labeled like large Tyco, high Tyco, um, large drum, medium drum, high drum, and metals, I think, is probably something along those lines. And then all these flying hand percussion things are also great. I love having all these individual things. Um, maybe it's just such a schedule crunch that I can't play a my cajon or my bass drum or my djembe or you know it's going to take me an hour to get it out and set up the mics and all that sort of stuff um, if it's a one-off thing like for um, a library track or uh, a tvq or a trailer piece 
sometimes it's just faster to get it down and use these samples and then once the cue is approved I might go back and replace them with uh, with live percussion. Now if it's a game a lot of times I'm developing my template kind of as I'm working so I would actually have things set up around maybe with let's say it's going to be a djembe um, I would have the djembe I would get it out and I would mic it and everything would be set in my patch bay over here let's see can I do this in my patch bay over here so I've got the mic set up to a certain input and I always know when I go to input you know 31 that that's the djembe and I'll probably even label it djembe so as I'm duplicating my cue sheets and getting all the cues for a particular game the the not only is the palette for the game set, but I've got all my hardware configurations set. That's just a kind of different thing than um, one-offs, which is what a lot of this is for. So seeing that we're at 45 minutes, um, you know, actually what I think I'm going to do is wrap up this session. So we've done a winds and drums, and then part two will be strings and synthesizers. Until then, have a great day. See ya.